Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our act of worship on this second Sunday in Eastertide. It's a strange experience, but it's still good to be together as we worship. And today we'll hear of Thomas, one of the apostles. We'll hear about Jesus bestowing his peace upon his followers. And the worship this morning will be led by myself, by Jill Ireland, Kathy Pickin, and Archdeacon Mark will offer the reflection this morning. And as the Easter people of God, we meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And join together in that great acclamation for Easter time. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And Kathy now will offer us a reflection in which she will help us think about Jesus bestowing that peace upon his followers. Welcome to the kitchen. Please excuse the mess. I was going to bake a cake this morning, but when I came to look at the ingredients, that was all the flour I've got left. Oh, I'm not going to be able to do much with that, am I? I went to our local shops, but the shelves were stripped. There just simply wasn't enough flour to go round. I reckon that nearly all of us will have experienced something like that in the past few weeks. None of us likes to miss out. We've been very fortunate in a lot of ways in our local suppliers and the shopkeepers are doing their best, but still, sometimes there just isn't enough to go around. I reckon we all know what that feels like. Whether you're young or old, you'll have all experienced something similar. It's a little bit like when you're in a playground at school and they're choosing football teams and you get to be the very last one to be chosen. I hate that, don't you? Or say, you look at Facebook and you check what's on and you find that your best friend has put some really important stuff on there I didn't tell you. I can't stand that. But still, it's something that we can all identify with. And if you listen carefully to today's gospel reading, there may be something in there that talks a bit about that feeling. Oh yes, and something else. See if you can notice, whenever Jesus appears to his followers after the resurrection, he says something really important. He says, peace be with you. That message is just as important for us now as it was then. Jesus knew his disciples were frightened. He knew exactly what they needed and he knows exactly what we need too. Thankfully, the peace of Christ is something that will never run short. Peace be with you. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Kathy. And now we sing our opening hymn together, The Day of Resurrection. <laughs>
as we come together as the people of God today, we know that there are things in our lives that we need to bring to God in our confession. So I'm now going to lead us in that confession. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with the living bread. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, now and always. Amen. Amen. And as the people of God celebrating God's forgiveness for us, we join together now in listening to the glory of the Song of the Angels. Glory to God in the highest. Glory. for today. Risen Christ, for whom no door is locked, no entrance barred, open the doors of our hearts that we may seek the good of others and walk the joyful road of sacrifice and peace to the praise of God the Father. Amen. Amen. The reading is taken from John chapter 20 beginning at verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, then they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here 
and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love the detail in this story that Jesus passed through locked doors to be where the disciples were. It reminds me of years ago when I was chaplain of Lancaster Prison and I had a set of keys that enabled me to unlock any door in the prison. It felt a big responsibility until I realised that it enabled me to pass through locked doors to be where my flock was. In this period of lockdown, uh, that's also a very comforting detail in the story. We may feel isolated, we may feel alone, but Jesus is able to pass through the locked doors of our homes to be here with us now. But in this story, you have to feel for Thomas, don't you? It seems so unfair that Thomas should have missed out that he wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to his disciples. After all, it was Thomas's idea that had taken them to Jerusalem in the first place. You remember when Mary and Martha summoned Jesus, the other disciples didn't want to go. But Thomas said, let us also go, that we may die with him. And yet we read in John's Gospel, but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas was a bit of a loner, it seems. Other disciples had brothers and we know their names, James and John, Simon and Andrew, Thomas and, well, he's just Thomas the twin. But the identity of his twin brother or sister is never mentioned. And on that first Easter evening, Thomas was alone in his grief. Grief does different things to different people. The other disciples had gathered together to comfort one another, perhaps to pray together. But Thomas was on his own, and so he missed out. But Jesus cares about the one who's left out, and that's a great comfort in this passage, that Jesus comes back specially for Thomas a week later. And in Jesus' encounter with Thomas, of course, Thomas gains the nickname Doubting Thomas. But really that's unfair. It's not that Thomas was an unbeliever. He had a questioning faith. He wanted evidence on which to ground his belief. You'll remember that in the Last Supper, um, at the Last Supper, uh, when Jesus was talking about the fact he was going to be taken away from them, it was Thomas who asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And it's Thomas here who says, um, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas questions because he wants evidence. But Jesus doesn't disapprove of Thomas's questioning or his need for evidence. In fact, Jesus comes back specially to offer Thomas exactly the evidence that he had asked for. And so he invites him to put his uh, finger in the mark of the nails. But interestingly, uh, uh, Thomas doesn't actually have to do that, even though in this uh, picture by Caravaggio, uh, which is called The Incredulity of Thomas. We see Thomas poking his finger um, into Jesus' ribs to check that the wound is real and, th and that it's Jesus. In the Gospel, there's no mention of Thomas actually touching the risen Christ. It is, as it were, in the words of the Collect for St Thomas's Day, which speaks of Almighty and Eternal God, who for the firmer foundation of our faith allowed your holy apostle Thomas to doubt the resurrection of your son till word and sight convinced him. 
it was word and sight which were sufficient for Thomas. And once he was convinced by that evidence, he became declaring Thomas. For Thomas was the first of the disciples to declare that Jesus is both Lord and God, my Lord and my God. But what about us? Uh, we haven't had the opportunity to see and believe and to hear the risen Christ. But what should convince us that the resurrection actually happened? Well, there's lots of evidence. There's the empty tomb uh, visited by hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I've been there with a group of pilgrims from this diocese. And it is empty, I can tell you. And even though people have been searching, sceptics have been searching for 2,000 years, nobody has been able to locate um, a body or a skeleton for Jesus, for he is alive. And there's the early eyewitness evidence. John's Gospel was written um, within a hundred years of the uh, events uh, that he describes. And there's a fragment of John's Gospel actually in the John Rylands Museum, uh, not far from here, in Manchester, dated from the very early second century. And all those eyewitness uh, testimonies in the New Testament uh, speak of uh, Jesus appearing to over 500 believers uh, at one time. And besides the, um, the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus, uh, there's also the evidence of the fact that the earliest Christians, there they were steeped in Judaism, immediately changed the day of worship uh, from uh, the Sabbath to Sunday. Something climactic must have happened on that Sunday to make them make that uh, the day of worship. And then there's the incredible spread and growth of the Christian church, uh, starting with the transformation of those sad and broken men hiding behind locked doors, who became fearless evangelists who overturned uh, the Roman Empire. And many empires have come and gone since. And yet the Christian church continues to grow globally. Now over two billion people, almost a third of the world's population, are baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And thinking of the church globally, daring Thomas, who became declaring Thomas, went on to become discipling Thomas. He heard the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations and Thomas took the gospel to India uh, where eventually he gave his life for the gospel, martyred for his faith near Madras in South India. And there the ancient indigenous church still bears his name today, the Martoma Church, the St Thomas Church. Like Mary Magdalene, whom Bishop Julian spoke about last week, Thomas goes on a journey from disillusion to discovery to declaration. But what about us here in Lancashire in 2020? What can we learn from Jesus' encounter with Thomas? Well, first of all, are we perhaps disillusioned, feeling alone and left out this morning? unable to gather with other Christians. Remember that Jesus cares about the one left out as he cared for Thomas and is able to pass through locked doors to be with us. Second, have we made the discovery that Jesus is definitely alive? Have we weighed the evidence as Thomas did? If we haven't, maybe this period of lockdown is a good time to do a bit of reading and research. And I would recommend an excellent book by Tom Wright, former Bishop of Durham, uh, who explores the historic evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and the implications uh, for our own Christian hope of life beyond death. It's a great read, very accessible, and you can order it from any uh, online bookseller. And if we have discovered that Jesus is really alive, uh, my third challenge is this, 
have we declared our faith in Jesus as Lord and God? And are we discipling others as Thomas did? A disciple is somebody who does what the master shows them. And if we're to be true disciples, we should also be making disciples. You may not get the chance to take the gospel to India, but maybe only you can take the good news to the people in your family, to the people in your street, to the people in your Facebook group. And as you and I find new ways to declare our faith and disciple others during this strange lockdown period, let's remember that we have a blessing that even Thomas himself did not have from Jesus. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So thank you very much, Mark, for your reflection this morning. And now we join together in our affirmation of faith, the creed. And we're using a version this morning from the very earliest writings of the church, from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. So please feel free to join me in saying this creed. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. So now we come to our prayers of intercession for today and the response to the words we pray to the Father are, hear our prayer. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. In joy and hope, let us pray to the Father that our risen Saviour may fill us and all whom we know with the joy of his glorious and life-giving resurrection. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer that isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the good news of Easter, even in these times when we're kept 
separated from one another. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That God may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That he may provide for those who lack food, work or shelter. In particular, we pray for those who at this time have uncertainty in their working lives, in their home lives. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That by his power, war, famine and disease may cease through all the world. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak and the dying, to comfort and strengthen them. We thank you for those who give of their own selves and their lives to support those in need at this time. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That according to his promises, all who've died in the faith of the resurrection may be raised on the last day. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, so that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you've delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as his death has recalled us to life, so his continual presence in us may raise us to eternal joy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Amen. Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now our final song this morning. See What a Morning by Stuart Townend. Just 
and as we end this act of worship, we call upon God's blessing. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Amen.